All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Alan Weiss, who is in Rhode Island. How are you doing, Alan? I'm good, John. Thank you. Yeah, and Alan is a, is a consultant, speaker, and author, and his consulting firm, Summit Group Consulting, uh, you know, works with high, you know, high very well-known uh, organizations like Hewlett Packard, GE, Mercedes-Benz, etc. And um, Alan is a author of many, many books. But what I wanted to talk to uh, Alan about today was about his book, Fearless Leadership. Um, so, Alan, you've you've written a lot of books on on you know many subjects but what what made you want to write one on particularly on leadership and and overcoming you know reticence procrastination and the voices of doubt inside your head well i've dealt in my career with top executives at major companies and also with uh, very successful entrepreneurs and uh, you know not so successful executives and not so successful entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and i realized that there was a self esteem issue that was at work and so i started to write about self esteem but then I asked myself, well, why do so many people have low self-esteem? And I determined it was because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. And I found that the best leaders and the best entrepreneurs either uh, consciously or unconsciously were unafraid. And so I wrote this book because there are, there are covert and overt reasons why people are afraid. And the subtitle you just read off is an example of that. Yeah, so it, it's it's interesting what you say because I mean you see a lot of um, what you would, as you said, what you would perceive as like successful people or people who are very talented. And one person mentioned to me a while back about this idea of imposter syndrome, where yeah, they've got all these skills and everything, but when they go to do something, they kind of they're they're gripped by the fear and the reticence that you talk about, and they think, well, I don't really, you know, I'm not really an expert, and I'm going to get found out, and and all of this kind of irrational fear. So you have the first chapter on real fear and fraudulent fear. What, what's the difference between the two? Well, you know, the, the imposter syndrome comes from, I think, Dr. Rose Chance, I think her name was, yeah. and it's decades old. Yeah. Uh, and it's never gone away because it's still a problem. So and when I started to look at fear, I found that real fear, of course, are things like, you know, a bear running after you or a tornado or a fire or somebody with a gun. Mm -hmm. That should cause fear. You know, my father jumped out of airplanes as a paratrooper into enemy guns. You know, that should instill some fear, I would think. But the other kind of fear occurs when we liken it to the same situation, though it's clearly not. So somebody who's a salesperson walks into a buyer's office and is afraid. A speaker walks on a stage and is afraid. Somebody sits down, they're afraid to write. So we write these off as writer's block or stage fright, but there's really no such thing. What we're doing is we're creating false fears in our mind. You know, like an example, no audience ever goes home and says, I had a great morning, I saw a speaker go down in flames, and I was able to contribute to it. You know, I mean, that's basically, you know, sociological behavior. So most people want you to succeed, but we create these false fears. Yeah, it's a really interesting one, because I mean, that is obviously the advice that's given to, you know, to a lot of people when they first start speaking, they say, you know, the audience wants you to succeed, people don't want you to, um, don't want you to, to fail. And yet, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, those kind of fears, you know, grip some people and, and they do go down in flames um, occasionally. Um, so what are some of the ways then that you can start to um, separate these fraudulent fears and really kind of analyze them and push them aside and realize that they're, they're things that you're imposing upon yourself? You ask yourself, what's the worst that ever has happened? For mm -hmm. example, nobody ever went into a buyer's office and came out poorer. No buyer has ever taken money from a salesperson. Uh, there's never been a trap door where the buyer pulled the lever and the salesperson disappeared into the abyss. Yeah. And so you say, what's the worst that's ever happened? Well, you know, I get thrown out of the office. Can you live with that? Sure. You know, uh, but people are too busy trying to protect their ego. Uh, what's the worst thing that happens when you're on stage and make a mistake? So mm -hmm. somebody corrects you or you correct it or it goes uncorrected. But, you know, it's hardly fatal. And, you know, I think it was Churchill who said, you know, success is never final and failure is seldom fatal. It's courage that counts. And so I began talking to people about having the courage of their talent. Yeah, because it's very true, because we do kind of build these things up. Uh, and then, when you, as you say, when you look at them, uh, uh, the, 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 the consequences are not, are not obviously not catastrophic usually. And uh, especially in normal, you know, in sales or whatever. 
Um, but you say, um, there's another chapter you talk about manifestations of, of fear. And I think this is a really interesting um, component here because I don't think we always recognize how our fears manifest themselves in our everyday lives. Well, we tend, to, you know, we tend to not do things or do things for no, uh, for no rational reason. You know, when we were kids, uh, we were told not to go into the water for an hour after eating because we'd get cramps yeah. and drown. And so, you know, at, at 58 minutes, we'd be standing on the beach saying, no, another two minutes, because if we go in now, we'll get cramps and drown. Well, of course, yeah. that was false because no one had ever walked around, you know, seeing people drown after eating. <laughs> Uh, but even now, you know, if, if, if the stereotypical example is a kid is afraid that there's a monster under the bed. Yeah. Well, if you can get the kid to look, give the kid a flashlight, there's no monster there. Now, that just means there's no monster there on the nights the kid happened to look. There could have been a monster the nights the kid didn't look. But the fact mm -hmm. is, the empirical evidence is, if there were a monster, it never hurt you. And so we have to look at empirical evidence and say, what really hurts us here and what doesn't? And uh, we ignore that because our egos, instead of being in the hold of the ship, safe and protected, are out on the bow, getting battered by wind and rain and everything else. And so we try to protect ourselves by sailing in a safe place. Mm -hmm. And so that, so I think then obviously, you know, part of the thing to look at is whether you take safe options all the time, you know, whether you avoid confronting these, uh, these things that maybe you're afraid of. Well, that's true. And if you want to look at very practical examples, you know, people who procrastinate are afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, people who delay getting things done are afraid. And the interesting thing is they are less afraid of people critiquing them for being late than they are for people possibly critiquing them for providing something that isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. now, perfectionism is another kind of fear. Perfectionism yeah. kills excellence. And it stops us from moving forward because nothing's perfect. But of course, nothing is ever perfect. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, every day we see these kinds of manifestations. And if you look today around in this, in this pandemic world, in this COVID world, you'll see that people who are less fearful, because many of the reactions to this have been just panicked and fearful and not rational. Sure. You'll find that people who are not fearful are doing better. They're doing well. And if you look historically, in times of depression and recession and plague and you name it, some of the greatest companies, the greatest innovations, the greatest initiatives have flowered. And so what do you think it is that makes those, what, what is it about those people who are doing better, who are less afraid? I mean, what, what, what characterizes them and, and separates them from the rest? You, you, you understand what the risk reward ratio is. Mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, Tlaib uh, in um, Anti-Fragile called it upside downside, and I've always called it, you know, risk reward. Uh, but we're talking about the exact same thing. And that is, if you take a look at the best that can happen and the worst that can happen, your decision's often made up for you. You know, sh God, should I put a, a more expensive proposal together? What's the worst that can happen? The buyer says no. What's the yeah. best that can happen? You have another $100,000 <laughs> in your pocket. And so I would say 97% of the time, something like that, when somebody says, should I do this? And I go through best case, worst case, the answer is do it. Mm -hmm. But we exaggerate worst case. You know, we exaggerate that people are going to laugh at us, that something will go wrong. And we don't have the wherewithal to say, so what? Yeah, the, no, it's an interesting thing. And it's also about, you know, we project onto other people and we think that, as, as you said, I mean, if your original um, your original point uh, about these speaking in front of an audience, like we, Im we imagine that these people are going to start laughing at us or making fun of us or, or whatever, when we know for, if we, if we take a step back, we know that that's not reality. That's not- It never really happens. Happen. I mean, yeah. the empirical evidence, it never happens. <laughs> so why be afraid of it? Exactly. Um, here's an interesting, you also talk about erasing past fears and there is, I mean, obviously we carry a lot of psychological baggage with us through life and sometimes we don't recognize it and we don't recognize where these things come from. So how do you, how do you look at maybe some fears from your past that may be holding you back that really, you know, you shouldn't hold on to anymore? I think we have to come to the realization that we all need baggage. There's nothing wrong with having mm -hmm. baggage, but the question is who packed it and when did they pack it? And so if our parents packed it, you know, 40 years ago, or our yeah. siblings packed it, you know, 20 years ago, that's no good. So we have to pack our own baggage and we have to constantly repack it for who we mm -hmm. want to be tomorrow, right? And the old baggage, you can't just drop on the train because it's still traveling with you at the same speed. So you got to throw it off mm -hmm. the train, you know, and risk killing a cow in the countryside. So what? Mm -hmm. So we have to go back and we have to ask ourselves, what are the origins of my being concerned about this? What are the origins of my being afraid here? And a lot of it turns out to be superstition, 
or an exaggerated story or a guess or an estimate and so forth. And you always have to ask yourself, what is the evidence? This is the key phrase. What is the evidence today that this fear is legitimate? Mm -hmm. And almost always, you know, it's not legitimate. Now, if you want to go swimming here off Nantucket, I'll be there next month, where they have these giant seals, you know, mm -hmm. resting in the summer, and you fear a great white shark, you're intelligent because the great white sharks eat on the, you know, eat these seals. And I don't know how good their eyesight is, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so and you don't want to be the and you don't want to be the slowest seal, right? You know, that's right. That's right. Yes. You only have to be the second slowest, right? So uh, but on the other hand, I mean, if you sit outside and say, Oh my god, I'm so worried, maybe we shouldn't go to the beach, it might rain today. Well, what's the worst case? You pack up, put your stuff back in your car, and you drive somewhere else. It is it's 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 fascinating. And I think one of the things that's probably good for people to do is to look back and maybe uh, consider the opportunities they have missed in the past because of those fears and really ask themselves, you know, was it worthwhile? And maybe that will help some people over, you know, make better choices in the future. If you realize there is a, as you said, earlier, there's a risk reward. There's a cost to giving into your fears. It's absolutely true. And a lot of people won't talk to the CEO of a firm because the person's very powerful and they're very bright and they don't suffer fools gladly. But when they notice that other people are talking up and the CEO respects opinions, then if they're willing to admit what they're seeing, they begin to speak up because they were working on a falsehood. They were working on uh, a guess as to how that person would react. And then when you talk about changing your metrics, what do you, what do you, number one, what do you mean by metrics and what do you mean by changing them? Well, I'm writing a new book right now called Legacy, and it's about meaning in life. And the fact is that people use all the wrong metrics. We use other people's metrics. So somebody mm. says, you know, well, you did really good in that test, but not as good as your sister. <laughs> so your sister becomes, you know, the higher metric. Uh, or you ran that race pretty well, you know, for someone of your size, right? <laughs> so you have to understand that you have, to, if you want to find meaning in life, it's not a search for meaning, it's a creation of meaning, which means you need your own metrics. Winning by a hundredth of a second or losing by a hundredth of a second, you know, is irrelevant. The metric is, did you compete? Did you do your best? Uh, did you enjoy yourself? Did you establish a good relationship? So we have to stop this incessant competition with others. We have to start thinking about what's meaningful to us. But too often, we're told what somebody else's metrics are. You know, I can tell a good coach from a bad one this way. A good coach says, let me tell you some ways that will work for you. A bad coach says, let me tell you how I do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a very good point. And, and unfortunately, we see that in business all the time, and particularly in in sales management where um, the idea of sales coaching, uh, people just go back to their high school football coach and think, what did he do? He just shouted at me and told me what to do. Right. <laughs> and I so- mean, If somebody said to me, look, how do I make it the consulting profession? And I said, well, write 64 books and have them in 15 languages. That's not very helpful. But yeah. if I said, pick a subject, pick 10 categories, which will be your chapters and start with this, that's doable. Yeah, no, absolutely, 100%. And, um, and I also think that, uh, as you said about finding meaning, I mean, we do live in this crazy like comparison culture today and like social media has made it worse and everything. And I think to your point, um, people have to pull back and figure out what's important to, to themselves and, and measure it against themselves. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I do a lot of martial arts and it's a, it's a big passion of mine. And that's all about you know, measuring and competing with yourself. It's not about the person beside you. It's not about the person in front of you. It's always about your own development. And I try to bring that into other aspects of, of, of my life. But I think that's, that's part of it is we live in this crazy comparison culture where everybody is, thinks that they're in competition with everybody now. Well, once a day, I see someone on social media or in an email who has 19 initials after their name, most of which are indecipherable. And the more initials I see, the more suspicious I get. And what they're doing is they're competing for credential. They're yeah. competing for credibility. They're competing on the basis of initials. And no one has ever sold me anything or, or uh, become my colleague based on how many initials they have. It's just stupid. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I absolutely, and I think that's where we. It, there's a super, there's a certain superficiality that uh, you know is kind of pervasive right now that people fall for a lot of, and I think there's a, I think that you know the pendulum has got to come back eventually to seeing substance over over superficiality, substance over initials. There you go. Um, and then when you say about organizing fearlessness, how do you organize fearlessness? 
I think you have to lead your life in such a way that you um, obviously refrain from doing very stupid things, right? <laughs> A, a very stupid thing, for example, is is racing down the highway at 140 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, things can happen that you're completely out of your control, a pothole, another driver, who knows what. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, however, you don't refrain from doing things that are largely within your control. So people go out the highway every day and drive at 70 miles an hour, you know, with uh, without the greatest distance between them and other cars, but they're, they're, they have some faith that everybody's going to do the right thing. Well, that's a legitimate kind of a faith. Uh, you know, that we don't have carnage all over the roads every day. In fact, mm -hmm. auto deaths are down. Interestingly, pedestrian deaths are up because people are walking across crosswalks with things in their ears, staring into a tablet, right? <laughs> so I think that we have to differentiate between what's reckless and what's prudent risk. And prudent risk should never work. It should never involve your ego, you know? You should be afraid to break an arm, <clears throat> but you can't break an ego. Yeah, yeah, no, that's very true. And and it's funny, it's like, um, that, that, you know, that concept of actually looking at, um, looking at an organizing and figuring the risk, right, and realizing that everything, everything in life comes at risk, and it comes with consequences, and it some comes with compromises. But just figure out all of those, and then it's, it's, it's much easier to move forward. That's right. That's right. And what, see, I'm a big, um, I'm a big fan of control. And there's mm -hmm. internal control and external control. So external control is the weather and the IRS and, and things like that. Internal control are the decisions you make, what you do about it. And there's a reciprocity there. But too many of us give up control. And uh, we cede control. And, and consequently, uh, our lives aren't as meaningful and our lives are much more fearful because we don't use the control that we do have. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. And, and a lot of times we, uh, you know, people just kind of outsource their lives to other people like just give up control of everything and you know let let life or fate or whatever make all their decisions for them well there's a, it's a, like a calvinistic predestination uh, don't bother making decisions it's all been decided for you already and you know while i admire people who are religious and i'm i myself mm -hmm. am religious you know i would never throw up my arms and say well there's nothing i can do it's in god's hands we all have free will and yep. we better exert that will or we're going to get tossed around by the tides and the winds yeah, no, that, I think that's a, that's a great analogy to, to end up in. Okay, so this is Alan, Alan Wise, Fearless Leadership um, is the book. And you said you have another book coming out. When is that? Uh, Legacy uh, will be our first thing next year, probably January. It's about how you create meaning in your life uh, instead of using other people's meanings. And uh, if you'd like some, any kind of free material about this, it's on alanweiss.com, A-L-A-N-W-E-I-S-S.com. It's free audio, free video, free text. That's fantastic. Um, um, I think that that's, uh, it's, uh, I look forward to that. I think it's a timely, it's a timely subject because I think if there's one thing that's maybe come out of, uh, of this pandemic is maybe people have had a little bit more time to reflect on their own lives and maybe start to figure out um, what is meaningful to them as opposed to, as you say, as opposed to just adopting other people's meanings, which I think a lot of people just go through life in a bit of a fog. Um, doing what they think is expected of them as opposed to figuring out what they what their real purpose is i hope you're right about that <laughs> all right well listen thanks alan i really appreciate your time today my name is john golden sales pop online sales magazine and pipeline of crm see you all for another expert interview really soon thank you <laughs>